So Lori Emerson is an associate professor in the Media Studies Department at the University of Colorado Boulder, director of Intermedia Art Writing and Performance Program, and founding director of the Media Archaeology Lab. Um, in uh, this talk, Future Histories of Our Networks, Lori will discuss the surprising depth and breadth of wired and wireless networks that preceded the internet, many of which still exist today. Please welcome Lori. Hello, everybody. I am super happy, grateful, psyched to be here with a room full of like-minded people. And I'm really grateful to Don and all the organizers for the work that they've done. Um, so Other Networks is the name that I've given to a cluster of projects on networks before and or outside of the internet. And I've been working on these uh, projects for some years, partly on my own and partly with Libby Striegel, who is the managing director of the Media Archaeology Lab that I also direct. Um, Other Networks, a radical technology source book is also the title of a book I wrote and that should be published in December by, strangely enough, an art book publisher um, that's based in New York. So today I'm going to start off by talking about why other networks are so important and I think I'm preaching to the choir. I'm not going to say anything that's going to surprise anyone here. Um, and then I'm going to talk about as many examples of other networks as we have time for. Um, I'm guessing that many people here already know about these networks, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, but the point of the project is really to make sure that everyone knows about these networks. Um, and even though I can only talk about a handful of these today, um, I think it's the, the sheer volume of other networks is important to show how much of this history has been forgotten or just brushed aside in the name of the new. In 1972, after four years as, as publisher of the Whole Earth Catalog, Stuart Brand wrote a piece for Rolling Stone magazine detailing the surprising convergences he saw happening between computer scientists at cutting edge research institutions like Stanford and Xerox Park and what he called the computer bums working to bring computers to the people. By this point, time-sharing networks had been around since 1961, and members of the counterculture were well on their way to launching their celebrated grassroots community memory project in 1973. And a little footnote, if anyone wants to do research, there were a community memory nodes set up here in Vancouver, and I can't find any documentation of that anywhere except some mention in some archives in uh, Mountain View. So there's a project for somebody. Um, the ARPANET had also been active since 1969. Many computers had emerged in the 1960s as smaller, more affordable alternatives to mainframe computers. Microcomputers, smaller and even more affordable computer kits for hobbyists had, become, uh, had begun appearing in 1971. And we were just a few years away from the advent of personal computers, pre-built machines for home use that featured keyboards and screens. By the early 1980s, an international power struggle was brewing over whether and how to connect the bafflingly wide array of computers and local, national, and international computer networks, which eventually resulted in the worldwide adoption of the protocol TCPIP. As you probably all uh, know all too well, the Transfer Control Protocol Internet Protocol enabled the interconnection of nearly any computer network to create the, the world's largest network of networks that we now call the Internet. As networks gradually moved away from the domains of government-regulated postal, telegraph, and telephone services and research institutions and moved toward the domain of massive international conglomerates, it became next to impossible to figure out where one network ended and another began, let alone where these networks were, how they worked, and how to determine the nature of our access. The community of community memory had largely been eclipsed by a cacistocracy of corporations, and I just learned that word a few months ago, and it's amazing. It means governed by the least qualified or most unprincipled citizens, and let me tell you, <laughs> living in the US right now, it's really, that's something. 
Um, at the same time as this momentous shift took place from the late 1960s to the mid-1990s, the public's collective memory of what had come before this period grew increasingly blurry and ill-defined, particularly in the face of these oft-repeated stories about the invention of the internet and its status as the apex of mostly American innovation. So now we're in 2024. And misinformation is a daily norm as our tracking, surveillance, and the monetization of every single click, scroll, or pause. At this moment, the internet seems to represent the very opposite of innovation, inventiveness, and progress. Even tech entrepreneurs seem aware we're living through a turning point, although depending on their values and investments, opinions vary on whether today's internet is taking a turn for the worse or for the better. In December 2023, the American tech executive and entrepreneur Anil Dash penned a piece, also for Rolling Stone, in which he said that with the increasing popularity of the relatively new and non-commercial social media platform Mastodon, along with what he called the raucous hedonism of Blue Sky, and I just kind of wonder whether his, his bar for raucous hedonism is a little low. Uh, <laughs> The world is witnessing the, this is his words, the complexity and multiplicity of the weirder and more open web that's flourishing today. But despite the potential pleasures offered, offered by Mastodon and Blue Sky, how weird can they really be if they all exist on the same infrastructures owned by the same multinational conglomerates and also all using the same protocol? Still, even though most internet platforms continue to push for the uh, centralization, conformism, and oppression that Felix Guattari ob observed in 1993, I think we are also witnessing a shift to what Guattari also observed, miniaturized systems that create the possibility of a collective appropriation of the media. And to me, a lot more compelling than the small servers participating in the larger Mastodon Fediverse, and I do love Mastodon, just for the record, um, are alternative networks ranging from barbed wire fence phones to zines and mail art, video phone, telex, and micro broadcasts. And that's not even really to mention the, the weirdest uh, bunch. Um, more, we often don't know just how compelling a network can be until we see artists exploring uh, the limits and possibilities of these networks. So the time has really come, I think, for us to excavate all those networks that came before, re-enlivening our sense of what we would like the internet to be. And the act of excavating and of digging down to uncover how these networks works, worked is key. I don't think it's enough to merely swap stories about networks we might not have heard of before, or to marvel at how uh, supposedly weird experiments undertaken with them. In defiance of the culture of exclusivity and the cultivation of inaccessibility that's really defined telecommunications since the advent of amateur radio in the early 20th century, we need to demystify how networks work and get back to laying the groundwork for anyone to, say, try attaching analog telephones to barbed wire or try picking up a soldering iron to build a super simple FM radio transmitter. Not only is another internet possible, but we're all capable of building our own networks. Um, and on that, woo! <laughs> on that note, um, Libby and I wrote this pamphlet. It's at the printer, and um, I brought a QR code. If you'd like to sign up to get a copy in the mail, we'll release a PDF sometime next month. And I would love everybody to build your own mini FM transmitter. So um, the excavation of these alternative networks is also important for giving us the tools to imagine how networks might be different. Based on past and present alternatives from all over the world, we can globalize and pluralize histories of the internet to empower people to reimagine the future of the internet as the future of networks. So on that note, I'd like to walk us through some of the networks I've mentioned so far. Um, my book is, you know, not surprisingly a little quirky. Um, it organizes networks according to their underlying infrastructure, not chronologically. So there is a big section on wireless networks, um, which includes drums, whistling, fire smoke signals, pneumatic tubes, skywriting, hydraulic semaphore, and so on and so forth. 
Um, there is um, another big section on wired networks, which is also subdivided by electrical wire and uh, barbed wire. And there's also a section on hybrid networks. These are networks that are both wireless and wired. And there is a half serious, half joking, mostly serious section on imaginary networks. But for the sake of everyone's sanity, I will talk about some networks today chronologically. So first one. Oh, here's the chronological list. There you go. More, more networks. Uh, no, it's not out till December, but thank you for asking. Yeah, December 10th. Yeah, I guess you could order it, pre-order it if you wanted to. Um, so, the first system for delivering mail was a privately run courier system developed by ancient Egyptians for royalty. It consisted of horse-drawn chariots which would travel from the royal court to a series of relay stations and then on to the recipient. Citizens and state bureaucrats would also have to rely on people willing to de deliver a letter for them while they were going somewhere else, usually by horse-drawn chariot or carriage. So it's worth noting that the use of animals for mail delivery is part and parcel of the history of the Postal Service. Um, while pigeons, camels, dogs, cats, to <laughs> varying degrees of success, uh, Donkeys and reindeer have all been used to facilitate uh, postal delivery. The use of horses has the longest history and it's the best known example. So this is a map of the Pony Express route. This is the most well known, but horses have been used to deliver mail since a very long time. Um, while numerous st state-run postal services were developed since the time of ancient Egypt, it wasn't until the 19th century that most countries had national and international postal delivery systems in place for the delivery of letters, postcards, and parcels. By the 1970s, mail delivery had expanded to include electronic mail sent via any number of networks, um, thereby introducing the now ubiquitous network for the exchange of digital communication and documents known as email. The best known artist's experience with the postal system began in 1962 with artist Ray Johnson sending letters with the instruction, please add to and return to Ray Johnson. This uh, inaugurated the New York Correspondence School, which eventually evolved into the international movement known as mail art. Mail art, uh, sorry, mail artists were in a sense hackers. They needed to know uh, extensive details about packaging, uh, packaging rules, and they needed to be able to navigate or circumvent postal workers themselves who had to be tricked into delivering everything from rubber stamps to prints, lettering, banknotes, stickers, tickets, artist trading cards, badges, food packaging, diagrams, and maps. It's also worth noting that the postal system, at least at this time, was an accessible and largely democratic network, and anyone with access to a mailbox and stamps could participate. A fence phone, also referred to as a barbed wire fence phone or a squirrel line, is the use of smooth wire running from a house to near, nearby barbed wire fencing to create an informal, ad hoc, cooperative, non-commercial, local telephone network. Two key developments happened in the 1890s that led to its adoption mostly by farmers, ranchers, uh, people living in rural or isolated areas, especially across the US and Canada. So first was the, oh, all right, let's go back. The first was the widespread availability and inexpensiveness of barbed wire in the 1890s. And the second thing was the erosion of Alexander Graham Bell's patent monopoly in 1893 and 1894, which led to the sudden explosion of about 80 to 90 independent telephone companies, uh, which were manufacturing telephone sets that could be used outside of the Bell telephone system. This sudden explosion of independent telephone companies also sent into motion the independent telephone movement led by everyday people who were mostly interested in obtaining greater community access to a basic utility. 
The independent phone companies also recognized that it was going to be too expensive to build lines in rural areas, and instead, they openly advised farm people to buy their own telephone equipment, build their own lines, and create cooperatives to bring phones to the countryside. In need of a practical way to overcome social isolation and communicate emergencies, weather, crop prices, um, ranchers and farmers started to take advantage of the growing ubiquity of both telephone sets and barbed wire fencing. And they would hook up telephones to wire strung from their homes to a nearby fence. Um, at the time, uh, telephones had their own battery, which produced a DC current that could carry a voice signal. Turning a crank on the phone would generate an AC current to produce a ring at the end of the line. Uh, someone named Bob Holmes describes the process. He says, the barbed wire networks had no central exchange, no operators, and no monthly bill. Instead of ringing through the exchange to a single address, every call made every phone on the system ring. Soon, each household had its own personal ringtone, but anyone could pick up. Talk was free, and so people soon began to hang out on the phone. The fence phone lines could also be used to broadcast urgent information to everyone on the line. And uh, maybe not surprisingly, the quality of the signal traveling over the heavy wire was actually really good. Um, but weather would often cause short circuits, which people would try to fix with anything that could serve as an insulator. So this included leather straps, corn cobs, cow horns, glass bottles, just about anything. Um, anecdotally, fence phones were still being used throughout the 1970s in Texas. Oh, there's the advertisement for barbed wire. Colonialism. What's that? Colonialism. Yes, exactly. I was going to say something like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, in 2014, artist Phil Peters and David Reuter installed a barbed wire phone, fence phone in a gallery in Chicago. Their installation hung telephones they had found at thrift stores from a barbed wire fence. The phones were connected to the barbed wire with simple, simple copper wire and alligator clips, and visitors could communicate with each other over the phones. And in the month of September, if anyone wants to come to Boulder on a whim, I asked my dean if she thought it would be a good idea to set up a barbed wire fence phone in one of the campus rooms, and she said, sure. So um, yeah, for the month of September, if you want to come to Boulder and check out a functioning barbed wire fence phone, um, you should do that. Video phone. A video phone is a standalone device that allows for the two-way transmission of live images over coaxial cable or telephone wires. They often, but not always, uh, include audio. Uh, the term video phone largely came into being in the 1980s with the advent of affordable devices capable of two-way transmission. Um, these devices were essentially very low-resolution televisions with built-in modems and cameras. One such device, originally called an iconophone and then later referred to as a picture phone, included two-way television, video telephony, and video conferencing. Um, and so it's really the, uh, the original uh, of contemporary web uh, conferencing platforms. In 1927, Bell Laboratories demonstrated their iconophone with a two-way transmission of then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover giving an address over telephone wire and over radio from Washington, D.C. to New York. By 1930, AT&T demonstrated two-way television. Um, and as the New York Times described, this was a near magical event. This is how it was described. Special television booths have been developed about the same size as an ordinary telephone booth. Upon entering the booth, the person to be televised sits in a swivel chair and faces a frame in which he will see the person at the other end of the line to whom he will speak. The face is illuminated by a mild glow of blue light which is reflected from the face to the photoelectric cells known as radio eyes. When the speaker turns in the chair and faces the apparatus, he sees on the glass screen the words iconophone, watch this space for the television image. Then this sign lifts like a magic curtain and in its place the animated picture appears of the person at the other terminal. 
Um, I, I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of or read pieces by Hugo Gernsback, but when Hugo Gernsback saw this demonstration of television, he started imagining television planes with radio eyes affixed to them, and he was basically imagining drones back in the late, the late 1920s. Um, subsequently, live image transmission devices were installed in post offices in Berlin and Leipzig, Germany in 1936, and these were linked by coaxial cable. By 1938, the Third Reich had extended the network to Hamburg, Nuremberg, and Munich, and they had made booths available to the public. Um, so one, I don't know if you'd call it interesting, thread that runs through my book is how the Nazis were really on the cutting edge of um, the development of telecommunications in the late 1930s. Very little to no progress was made on the video phone until well after World War II. Well, AT&T reportedly promoted their then trademark picture phone at the World's Fair in 1939. A complete system wasn't really implemented until 1959. This was demonstrated at the World's Fair in New York in 1964. Um, a critic named John Gertner, this, this, actually this is a person, a picture of a young woman who was auditioning for an opera, actually, on the picture phone in New York. So this is how um, a writer for the New York Times described the experience. People would enter one of seven booths and sit before what was called a picture unit. The device was a long oval tube measuring about one foot wide and seven inches high and about a foot in depth. Set within the oval face was a small camera and a rectangular video screen. The picture unit was cabled to a touch-tone telephone handset with a line of buttons to control the screen. If you wanted to make a picture phone call at the fair, or more precisely, if you wanted to talk with other picture phone users at other booths, you pressed a button marked V for video. Um, and then you could talk either through the handset or the speakerphone on the picture unit. So a couple months later, um, you could find a picture phone booth set up in New York, Washington, D.C., and Chicago. Um, a three-minute conversation would have cost you about $16, which is uh, $160 in 2024. Um, that's for three minutes. AT&T continued to try to expand picture phone service across the U.S., but they shut the project down in 1974 after they had invested about a billion dollars, and that is $6.25 billion in 2024 dollars. Um, while similar picture phone services were launched in France, Russia, Sweden, and the UK, the emergence of digital telephone networks coupled with Japan's development beginning in the mid-70s of what became video phones were all responsible for the worldwide popularity of the, the device. Um, now, with the phasing out of both the public switch telephone network and also the integrated services digital network, Video phones are increasingly difficult to use for long distance communication, but they can still be connected to each other and the distance of transmission is almost entirely dependent on the length of the telephone cable uh, connecting the two video phones. So this is Libby and I entertaining ourselves during the height of the pandemic. Lots of hello, hello. <laughs> Um, in terms of artists' experiments with video phones, in the summer of 1984, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz initiated an ambitious project called Electronic Cafe. Electronic Cafe consisted of five cafes located across LA, each of which housed elaborate networks of telecommunication devices for members of the public to experiment with, um, probably for the first time in their lives. So each setup included teleconferencing equipment, audio conferencing equipment, telephones, video cameras, monitors, video printers, slow scan TV transceivers, computer conferencing services, and databases. And at some point I came across a, 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 their budget, and their budget was like, I don't know, it was like almost $200,000 and they got most of their funding from NSF and NASA, which I thought was interesting. Um, in 1987, Galloway and Rabinowitz then launched Electronic Cafe International, and this was a collection of about 60 nodes around the world that produced and participated in virtual events. 
The events relied heavily on video phones for the transmission of still images. Oh, I have a picture. There we go. Video phones were featured in numerous um, Electronic Cafe International events throughout 1991, and they included um, international link-ups with Timothy Leary, online meetings with children for some reason from the US, Japan, and South Africa, um, a video phone celebration of American composer Pauline Oliveras, which included 50 artists and about 20 sound and video technicians in six cities and three time zones. So this is a lot for 1991. In 1986, roughly at the same time, uh, Van Gogh TV was formed by artists and hackers from Austria and Germany. Um, working mostly in interactive TV, they're probably most well known for their 1992 project called Piazza Virtuale that lasted for 100 days during the contemporary art exhibition Documenta 9. Um, the most surprising, even shocking aspect of Piazza Virtuale was that with the help of picture phones as well as fax, slow scan TV and satellites, um, visitors experienced TV as an interactive medium rather than a broadcast medium. Um, a critic, Tillman Baumgartel, describes it this way. He says, there were no presenters, there were no announcements, no explanations, in fact, no show at all. Instead, you could call a telephone number that was displayed on the TV screen, and if you were lucky and got through, you were suddenly on air and could speak to the world via TV. Up to four callers found themselves in a strange, random community. They could chat with each other, or they could give a speech to mankind. Many callers were so startled that they hung up immediately. Others managed little more than, hello. Some tried to make conversations with the other co uh, callers. Others made farting noises until they were thrown off the line. <laughs> Telex. Telex is also known as Telephone Typewriter or Teletypewriter Service or TWX. Um, one of many things that made this project confusing is that Telex can refer to the teleprinter machines, uh, can refer to the messages, the service, or the network of teleprinters that span the globe. Considered as a whole, um, Telex is primarily for text-based communication and it uses the circuits of the public telephone switch uh, network and sometimes private lines. The sending and receiving devices are teletypewriters or teleprinter devices, and the sending and receiving signals are derived from telegraphic signaling uh, in that the presence or absence of a, of a level of electric current indicates a mark and a space. And these are either recorded on paper tape or they're automatically converted to characters. Um, while Telex might use the circuits of the public switch telephone network, the network itself uses a five-bit digital code and a separate system of assigning Telex numbers. Um, Telex has actually remained a popular communication network for the last 100 years because it um, is an inexpe inexpensive way to simply and securely transmit legally recognized messages, and apparently this is still the case. Um, the first documented and publicly available telex network was AT&T's teletypewriter exchange service. This was called TWX. This is what you're looking at here. This was launched in 1931 with 16,000 teletype machines. After this point, still more machines were installed in companies, banks, and newspapers across the company. Uh, country. To make a call, the customer looked up the number in the nationwide TWX directory and called the operator to be connected. Once you were connected, the two subscribers could type their messages and replies. Then a year later, in 1932, Western Union inaugurated its own telex network called Timed Wire Service and it used uh, telegraph lines for one-way customer use. Given that sending a telex was cheaper and in many ways easier than placing a long distance phone call, it was quickly adopted by the press, travel agencies, airlines, governments, and embassies. As the decades went on, Western Union kept uh, developing its telex network and it launched an automatic telex service between New York and 12,000 subscribers in Canada in 1958. 
1969, sorry for all these dates, I hope this is not boring. Um, <laughs> hang in there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is the right crowd. In 1969, Western Union purchased AT&T's TWX network, making them the de facto provider of telex to the US until the end of the service in 2006. Um, in terms of telex networks elsewhere, um, networks in Europe were set up between Berlin and Hamburg from 1933 to 1935 for about 40 private subscribers. The German Reichspost adopted the system in 1935. By 1940, the German Telex network had roughly 10,000 subscribers. After that point, networks were set up in England in 1935, France in 1946, Japan in 1956, and Australia in 1959. By 1970, telex was available between North America and Europe and most countries in the world. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. By its peak in the late 1980s, telex had roughly 1.7 million subscribers worldwide. Um, it was eventually eclipsed by telefacsimile or fax and also computer-based uh, communication systems like email, but it's still being used today. Um, people have told me that uh, in the Balkans they use telex to send uh, telegrams to express condolences, like this year people are doing that. Um, you can also use the service called International Telegram or iTelegram, you can find it online, to send or receive telegrams around the world. Um, this company purchased the former Western Union telex network. Um, and so I got a telegram for my birthday on this, on this network. Um, and they still say that um, people use these, this telex network for canceling contracts and sending legal notifications because a timestamp copy of the message is retained in their files for seven years and can be legally verified. All right. One of the best known instances of artists using telex for the production and distribution of art was the conceptual art collective called NE Thing Co, formed by Ian and Ingrid Baxter here in Vancouver in 1967. Until their breakup in 1978, the pair used Anything Co as a way to appropriate the discourse of capitalism for artistic ends. Um, for them, the telex uh, symbolized corporate legitimacy and throughout the 60s and the 70s, it was also just a very deeply ingrained means for conducting business. So Anything co-created many um, telex and telecopier works between 1968 and 1970. This is one of them that you're looking at. And they depict these uh, triangle-shaped networks of nodes across maps of Canada and the US. Well, the telexes themselves inscribed these shapes as they were transmitted from place to place. Um, Joan Lowndes wrote in the Vancouver Sun in 1970 that Anything Co. are concerned at the degree to which we are U.S. dominated and believe that communications represent a field in which we can win international prominence. In other words, their appropriation of the telex was an attempt to intervene in the Canadian media communications landscape, which was in the, still is, dominated by content from the U.S. Uh, for the duo, the most powerful affordance of the telex was the fact that it's an open channel. This is a quote from that Vancouver Sun article. No one can stop the telex from working because it's a 24-hour-a-day communication hookup. As soon as you dial the number, you're really into that office. This quality was truly rev revolutionary for 1970s, and this is, of course, decades before the internet became affordable and accessible. Here's another telex. At the same time as Anything Co's experiments with telex was the Chilean project called Project CyberSign. Ooh, it's not art, but it's art adjacent, I guess. Um, this lasted from... <laughs> This lasted from, I love this crowd. This is just, you're making my life. Uh, Project CyberSign lasted from 1971 to 73. Salvador Allende's popular unity government brought in the, okay, 
um, British cyberneticist Stafford Beer to propose what they called a real-time control system capable of collecting economic data throughout the nation, transmitting it to the government, and combining it in ways that could assist government decision making. So when Beer arrived in Chile in 1971, there were only 50 computers in the entire country. And this is what made Beer adopt what he, what, well, what the New York Times now says is a cloud-based solution. Sorry. <laughs> he proposed they use the more than 400 telex machines that they found in storage from a previous government regime, install them on factory floors to communicate production data to the telex machine and the National Computer Corporation in Santiago. And at this point, programmers would translate the telex data into punch cards that were then fed into the IBM mainframe computer. The system played an important role in the events of October 1972, when 40,000 truck drivers went on a month-long strike, and the government used the telex machines to try to organize alternative transportation. Beer believed that during the strike, roughly 2,000 messages were transmitted a day over the network. And sadly, Project CyberSign came to an end with the military coup and Allende's death on September 11th, 1973. Okay, my last network, microbroadcasting. It is often interchangeably used with the terms micro radio and mini FM, sometimes even free radio. These are a collection of practices involving the use of a low power transmitter over a limited distance to reach a limited number of people. It's also con considered a type of community media because of its local and non-commercial nature. Given the low power, and short distances involved, and it can be, it can use as many as 100 watts, but usually as low as one watt, and it can uh, transmit as far as five kilometers, but it's usually much shorter. Uh, micro broadcasting can be both unlicensed and legal. Um, however, regulations determining the legal status and the power of micro broadcasting vary over time and from country to country. If national regulatory bodies prohibit individuals from transmitting to their local community, microbroadcasting can quickly turn into pirate radio. As Tetsuo Kogawa writes, this is, you're looking at him right now, in a piece called A Micro Radio Manifesto, micro means diverse, multiple, and polymorphous. If micro does not mean small and physical size, then even physically bigger radio stations could become micro. Microradio is an alternative to mass medium and global communications that could cover the globe with the qualitatively same and patterned information. Microbroadcasting then, it's a social practice aimed at providing diverse points of view while also resisting the commodification of these points of view. Um, based in Bologna, Italy and lasting from 76 to 1981, the unlicensed radio station Radio Alice was probably the first instance of microbroadcasting. Even though it was referred to as free radio and it predated the emergence of the term microbroadcasting, its main founders envisioned Radio Alice as a conscious microradio experiment that tried to distribute control of the airways across many small transmitters as a way to flatten hierarchies between sender and receiver, embrace localism, and use art to unsettle, if not unseat, capitalism. As the editors of the Toronto-based magazine The Red Menace wrote in 1978, Radio Alice broadcast news of the events as they occurred, often by airing telephone calls from militants who described events, called for assistance in a given scepter, and reported police movements. The station was twice raided and closed down by police, but it resumed broadcasting by switching locations and resorting to a transmitter powered by a car radio. A few years later, in the early 1980s, Tetsuo Kagawa introduced free radio to Japan, calling it Mini-FM, as he led the way to hand-building tiny FM transmitters that used less than 100 milliwatts and only had a half-mile radius. The term micro-radio or micro-broadcasting then emerged in the U.S. in 1983 in the wake of the police beating of African-American Duane Reedus that took place in a public housing development in Springfield, Illinois. Ritas, who changed his name to Mbana Kantako, sorry, Kantako, first created the Tenants' Right Association, and to make sure that they could reach as many residents of the development as possible, he created radio station WTRA using a one-watt transmitter and broadcast from his living room. 
1988, WTRA became Zoom Black Magic Liberation Radio, then Black Liberation Radio, followed by Human Rights Radio. So I'm going to end there. And I'm just going to point you to the other network site that has information on our pamphlet explaining how to make a Tetsuo Kagawa-inspired mini FM transmitter. We've got some easy experiments for DIY networks. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
Uh, it was a very uh, anti-establishment uh, activity until the mid-90s, late 90s. Um, and I thought it was interesting that you know a number of the networks that you talked about, including you know this failed $5 billion investment in video phones, right? That was by a monopoly incumbent who had the money to do that. And they kind of rolled over and take over the internet effectively, yeah. right? And uh, uh, to some extent, we let them do that mm -hmm. uh, in the name of you know, uh, efficiency. Mm -hmm. the, the packet radio mechanisms, which were very popular in the 80s and 90s, well, they were, they peaked at 56K, and people rapidly realized they could get a DSL line that's at an order of magnitude faster, and and that, that killed a lot of activity. Yep. Um, and I also say that the, the, the whole telegraph, you know, sending money stuff, that only worked because it was a centralized monopoly, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's sort of interesting, this, this series of things that are, you know, kind of start as decentralized things get, you know, turned. Yeah. And so, Rather than fight that situation, what I see is that uh, we're simply here to enable the next revolution and always to step, stay kind of one step away from, like I imagine, like you know, kids jumping over waves as the well, as the ocean comes in, right? Well, it's continuous. You're not, you can't fight the ocean, but you can't jump over the waves mm -hmm. as they come, and we can be on the edge continuously. Yeah. I love that. I don't really have much more to add, except that I, I think this is behind what you're saying, is that the, what needs to change fundamentally is our unwillingness to be productive. I, I really think that the, the push toward efficiency and productivity is the thing that pushes us toward just feeling like we absolutely just have to go along with things. So, yeah. Okay. This is this is my uh, impossible task as an educator is to try to convince my students to not be productive. I see one more hand, and I think that'll be the last question. Thank you. This will be open. Um, um, the sort of implied but not clear to me: the telex networks did they all merge and become one network? Like, did they talk to each other, or did they stay? Uh, uh, they, uh, in the U.S., they were. Oh. In the U.S., they were separate for a time, and then they merged, and then I think there was like cooperative, a cooperation between uh, telex networks internationally. I think is what happened. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we'll stop taking questions in the room now. If you have more for Lori, maybe go find Lori in one of the breaks. How do we get your book? Oh, thank you. Um, a pre-order from the publisher in November, unless you like Barnes and Noble on Amazon. Uh, anthology editions. Thanks. Pre-order from anthology anthology editions. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take two minutes for Joni to come in and get set up here, and then we'll get started, and I'll introduce them. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. <laughs>